Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage former White House Senior Advisor David Axelrod and former U.S. Secretary of the Treasury Hank Paulson. Thank you. Uh, I just, we just briefly want to welcome you here. We've got a wonderful and uh, uh, profound program, I think, uh, uh, today. So we want to get right to it. Let me say that the financial crisis, the, the obvious, the financial crisis of uh, 2008 was a very consequential event. In some ways, it was uh, a triumph of uh, bipartisan cooperation uh, to avert uh, an utter catastrophe. On the other hand, uh, it had profound impacts on our economy, on social cohesion, uh, on uh, faith in institutions that we're going to be living with uh, for some time to come. So it is altogether fitting that we spend uh, a day looking back at what happened and uh, what's happened uh, since. And that's the purpose of this event. And I just want to thank all the splendid people who have come to participate on our panels and uh, these young people from the Institute of Politics. Uh, our mission is to uh, encourage uh, young leaders uh, to go into the public arena. And I think if you mingle with them over the course of the day, uh, you'll uh, leave here much more optimistic about the future, as I do every day when I uh, spend my time at the Institute of Politics. And with that, uh, let me uh, introduce Secretary Pauls. Okay, well, D David, thank you, and uh, let me add my welcome. Uh, thank you all for uh, for being here today. The, uh, the the Paulson Institute, which is the next door neighbor of the Institute of Politics at the uh, U University of Chicago, is primarily focused on U.S.-China relations. We have five people in Beijing. We have four or five in Washington and five here. But we have an opportunity to do a number of other things at the University of Chicago, in including working on a project like this with David. As he said, the, um, th this is a bipartisan event, and it's particularly fitting that it's a bipartisan event. When I take a five-year look back at the crisis, one of the things I'm most grateful for is that Republicans and Democrats came together to avert disaster. And there is great uh, policy continuity across administrations when we look at the capital market stabilization programs. As David said, we have a great group of participants on our panels. These are the leaders that were on the firing line during the crisis. And then uh, the journalists that are, that, that are moderating the panels are some of the most knowledgeable and sophisticated and best journalists who, who, who covered the crisis, men and women who covered the crisis. So a big thanks to our, uh, to our panelists for being here. And lastly, why are we doing this? None of us ever want to go through something like have our nation go through another crisis like the 2008 crisis. Uh, we can't forget the lessons learned. We need to clean up our messes. Uh, we can't make the same mistakes again. So again, uh, looking forward to a very, very productive and informative day and welcome and let's get on with the conference. Join the conversation on Twitter. Tweet using hashtag five years later and follow the Paulson Institute at Paulson Institute and the Institute of Politics at UChicago Politics. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Austin Goolsby, Edward Luzier, Lawrence Summers, Philip Swagel, and the Wall Street Journal's David Wessel. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm honored to be here with Austin Goolsby, who was in the Obama White House, Eddie Lazier, who was in the Bush White House, Larry Summers, who was in the Clinton and Obama White House, and if you believe what the press says, is either single-handedly responsible for the economic crisis, or if only they listened to him, we wouldn't have had one. Uh, and Phil Swagel, who was at the Treasury during the, the Bush crisis. And what, uh, the Bush administration during the crisis. <laughs> no, no. Caused, caused, caused the crisis, really, <laughs> is the way I think of it. 
um, so okay, that's one joke at my expense. I get one at each of theirs. Yeah. Um, and, and we're going to focus a little bit on the economic implications of the crisis because there are other things later. And uh, as I've told my the panelists up here, I want to think about both what what we know now about 2008, 2009 that wasn't so clear at the time, but also about 2013 and why we are where we are. Um, um, and Eddie, let me, let me start with you, because you were uh, just chronologically. Um, I think that there are a lot of Americans who say basically what happened here was Wall Street got bailed out and Main Street didn't. After all, the stock market's back, the banks are making money, we still have a lot of unemployment. So if somebody walked in off the street today and said to you, you guys, you all did what you thought was right, but basically Wall Street got bailed out and Main Street didn't. How, what would you say to him? Well, I would start by saying that certainly wasn't the goal, and I don't think it was the outcome. Uh, the goal that uh, President Bush had in mind was making sure that the economy kept functioning, and he was willing to do whatever it took to get that to happen. Uh, the central part of the crisis, as you know, uh, going back to actually to 2007, but really when it peaked in September of 2008, was that the financial sector really froze. and. Uh, the feeling was we had to do something and do something quickly to get that moving. So uh, that did mean that some people were bailed out. There's no doubt about it. I remember being asked on TV, you know, aren't you guys worried about the moral hazard? And you know, my response was, well, duh. You know, of course we're worried about the moral hazard. Uh, the issue is, um, what are the consequences of not dealing with it right now? And I think the president and uh, all the people in his administration felt that was really the primary concern. And Austin, what would you say to someone asked you that? There were a lot of bailouts. I mean, some of Main Street got bailed out. Usually when people say that, it's more frustration, I think, with how our conditions, they just still don't seem that good. The unemployment rate is still high. You know, we, we, we haven't had growth for a long time. And it's hard to dispute that that's true. It's just hard to figure out what, is, what, what else would we have done? You know, how would we do that? Hmm. Larry, let's take this a little chronologically, and I think it would be more fun to have you talk about what the Bush administration did and then have the Bush administration talk <laughs> about what the Obama administration did. Yeah. So it's the spring of 2007, and uh, the, first, the biggest shock is that Bear Stearns goes under uh, or is sold with a lot of government subsidy at, to J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, what should we have done after that that we didn't do that might have put us in better shape? Let me just say something quickly on the, on the previous point. Uh, just wars have unintended victims, and appropriate bailouts have regretted beneficiaries. Nonetheless, it is the case that if you look at the shareholders of Fannie, Freddie, Wamu, Wachovia, Bear, uh, Bear Stearns, Lehman, they are zeroed. If you look at the shareholders of Citigroup and Bank of America, down 90 down 90 percent. So one, if you look at the vast majority of the CEOs involved, gone. So y you can overstate uh, the extent to which uh, everyone was uh, bailed out. Look, everybody is. Everybody tends to remember their own prescient comments better than they remember their own not prescient comments and I'm about to be and I'm about to be uh, guilty uh, guilty of that. It seemed uh, to me from 2000 from the beginning of 2008 onwards and violently after Bear Stearns had failed that the system was very substantially undercapitalized fragile and at risk. And there were a variety of junctures at which substantial capital could have been raised before Bear Stearns failed and in the early summer, uh, uh, well before Lehman failed, when very substantial capital could have been raised. And if you look at capital raising by the major financial institutions, if you look at suspensions of dividends by the major financial institutions, there was essentially none. And it does seem to me that that is a major failure on the part of their managements in not recognizing the need to shore up the defenses. 
And it does seem to me that it is a failure of the regulatory community not to have used the authorities they surely possessed and the moral suasion that was surely at their disposal to have pressed for very substantial uh, capital uh, raising. It is not that it was impossible to tell from the stock market that there was potential very substantial fragility in the financial sector. It is not that it is inconceivable that suitors could have been found for Lehman in May or June. Yes, they couldn't have been found at prices that were attractive to managements who had been conditioned uh, by, the, uh, by the previous environment. But if you look back, that was a moment when both the private and the public sectors, it seems to me, missed an opportunity to take steps that could have at least very substantially attenuated the declines uh, in output. And it goes to an issue which I have to say I am still concerned is with us today. You know, the SEC issued a report the week after Bayer, Bayer failed, in which they said that Bayer was well capitalized the day before its failure. Now, how do you interpret that? I would interpret that as suggesting that current definitions of regulatory capital are flawed as an indicator of uh, fragility. Something similar is true with respect to the capital ratios as reported and judged by regulators for a variety of the other institutions that failed or found themselves in serious trouble. We have seen an enormous argument and productive argument around raising capital ratios and raising liquidity standards, and I think that is all very, very much to the good. But I still worry about carrying on the dialogue in terms of a concept that was professing that institutions were so well capitalized when they somehow weren't invulnerable, which is all that you really care right. about. Okay, so Phil, you were there. Larry says uh, you made a big mistake between Bear Sturman's and Lehman and not making them raise capital. And you say? Um, I mean, there's lots of things that, that I think many people in retrospect wish could have been done during that period, and having some sort of resolution authority is, is number one. But obviously, that, that wasn't possible, right? The idea of going to Capitol Hill and saying, look, you know, Lehman hasn't failed, but look what happened to Bear. Give us the authority to, to do the sorts of things that are entitled to Dodd Frank, you know, which is pretty uh, incredible power. I, I just don't think that was just, uh, realistic. Um, I, in some sense, I, I think back to the you know five years ago, the period between the uh, you know the announcement of the TARP and its enactment. Right, one of the things we at Treasury were doing was trying to explain why the problems on Wall Street mattered for Main Street. Which, I mean, of course, in retrospect, it looks preposterous, but it was still the, the dialogue. Was, look, that's there. Lehman is something else. Um, so there's there's just this disconnect, and I, I think rewinding to June or something when, you know, it didn't seem to be a problem. I, I think it's just unrealistic. But Phil, in fairness, um, I, mean, I, I mean, at one level I take uh, your point that it is much easier to see these things with 2020 hindsight, and by the way, it is much, much easier to sit on the outside, having done both, mm -hmm. it is much, much easier to sit on the outside and rop, write op-eds about the bold steps that should be taken than it is to actually undertake them on the inside. So I think that's completely fair, and I don't think anybody should be faulted mm -hmm. for any, for, you know, I think everybody, everybody did the best they could, and I think the country in both administrations, frankly, was very well served uh, by the people who had uh, positions of uh, responsibility in the financial There's sector. There's a but coming. That, yeah, there is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, yeah, there, yeah, there is. Go ahead. Uh, that, uh, that's, uh, that said, um, you said no one in June could have realized how serious it is. I refer you to my op-eds and the op-eds of plenty of other no. people. No, 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 the op-eds no, no. of so plenty of other people who were saying that the system was undercapitalized no, at that time. So let me well, just be clear. I, and so this, I, I, what I mean is going up to uh, to the hill and obviously. No, no, but nobody has to, you didn't have to go up. Nobody had to go up to the hill to tap institutions on the shoulder 
and say that their regulators were gravely concerned about their situation, that their regulators <laughs> would publicly call on them to suspend dividends if they did not take steps uh, to raise capital. So, so okay. no, look, I'm not, no authority I'm, on the Hill was I'm just, necessary I'm just, for I'm that. just not that critical of Tim Geithner and his role as New York Fed president, saying that he should have been going to the firms and, and doing this. I, I mean, I Why think not? he was doing a lot of good things, shoring up the tripartite re repo system, and between Hank and Bob Steele and others, uh, you know, going to firms and saying, look, you need to raise more capital. I, I think that was a regular message uh, from the Treasury. Okay. Let's Did any on. firms raise right. capital? Okay, uh, you made the point. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Eddie, the, the signal, when, when, when uh, Obama comes in and he discovers that the economy is a whole heck of a lot worse than he had believed, or his economists had led him to believe uh, with their great crystal balls, um, one, one thing they did was a, what seemed at the time a, a substantial fiscal stimulus. With the benefit of hindsight, was that the right thing to do and was it of the right size, shape, and design, given what we know now? Well, I think it was not. And remember, the Obama stimulus was not the first stimulus. It was the second. Right. Uh, the first stimulus was actually under the Bush administration. That happened with uh, checks that went out in May of 2008. Uh, we studied that. We studied the effects of that stimulus. Um, they were modest at best, uh, and I think that's consistent with the historic evidence. Uh, the reason I think that everybody was groping for a stimulus solution to this is that we, we were virtually, at that point, everybody was desperate. It was not really that we felt that this would necessarily work, but I think everybody felt we have, had to try something. This is in, in the, uh, the Bush stimulus? Well, I think in both, both periods. So you both would not, periods. you would have, if you were Barack, if you had been advising Barack Obama, you would have said, based on the Bush experience, don't do fiscal stimulus? No, that's not what I said. What I said was, looking at it at that time, I think everybody felt that it was necessary to do something. The question is, did I believe it would have been effective? Based on the historical record, I don't think it would have been <laughs> effective. I don't think it was particularly effective, and I think it was the wrong strategy. What do I mean by wrong? It was the wrong strategy in that it was a short-run strategy rather than a long-run strategy. We're sitting here now five years later. This is the long run. At this point, we have not uh, put in motion the kinds of growth policies that are, I think are necessary to get us moving. Stimulus is not a growth policy. Stimulus is a stopgap policy. At best, even if you believe in stimulus through national income accounting, Keynesian model, you pick it. Uh, it's not designed to encourage long-term growth. The things that encourage long-term growth are more structural. They're things like the tax system. They're things like the regulatory structure. They're things like economic trade. They're things like the budget structure. Yeah, but it's All the fourth of those... quarter of 2007. The economy's falling at a 9% rate. If dealing with the short-term problem with stimulus isn't the right medicine then, when is it the right medicine? It isn't the right medicine. That's the point. Austin? Look, I think the, my perception of the kind of problem that Washington is capable of dealing with is a problem that the right answer is everybody gets a quarter of what they wanted and they staple it together. At the time, the so debate about... It's a about, very high ratio. I think most of it is every four people get one-eighth of what they want. Yeah, okay, maybe, but, but that idea, um, <clears throat> as opposed to there's four different things and only one of them's correct and we have to orient around deciding which one is correct and only do that. So when we come in uh, and need a stimulus, I think th we thought the economy was shrinking at three and a half percent and everybody's looking at each other saying this is, a mo this is gonna be horrible and it turns out it was actually minus nine percent. There was a division of opinion at the time is this going to be V-shaped recovery where we have a huge downturn and then we're going to come rapidly back? Is this going to be long, extended, painful deleveraging? Is this going to be something that we will be able to get a bunch of Republican votes on? Those three camps turn into, should this be short-run oriented, pulling out of 2010 into 2009, I'll characterize? Should this be long-term stuff? like infrastructure or structural things, should this be predominantly tax cuts? What, what ends up happening is some combination of all of those, where they say, okay, we'll do a little of this and this and this. After the fact, you look back, short run oriented things like cash for clunkers, first home buyer tax credit, I think you'd say given that it wasn't V-shaped recovery, we probably should not have oriented as much of the money toward moving from, from 010 or 011 into 09. 
you would do more on the long-term structural side. I think the argument that ended up turning about a, more than a third of the stimulus into tax cuts, we're going to look back and say that wasn't that effective. Because at a moment where everybody's trying to deleverage, they took the tax cut and tried to pay down debt. And it didn't get that many Republican votes anyway. So some parts of the stimulus, I think, would have been better off moved into others. But I think the thought that we shouldn't have been doing as much as we could when the economy is shrinking 9%, I, to me, is, is borderline okay. nutty. So one of the advantages, oh, Larry? Look, I, I'd say a few things. First, it was clear that the economy was demand constrained and the priority had to attach to increasing demand, not raising the supply potential of the economy, and that that was going to be the case for a number of years. Second, the, I think the policies that were enacted probably were as good as could be done given the political constraints and prevailing attitudes at that time. Third, in retrospect, it would have been better to have embarked on a longer term demand expansion program. That was not politically planetary at that moment because there was great concern about the deficit. And so stimulus had to be in short run before we could pivot to deficit reduction, which was seen as essential by Republicans and by a substantial number of Democrats on the Hill. And so turning it into long, turning it into long run was not a politically viable strategy at that moment. We put as much infrastructure investment into that program as we could convince anybody was plausible would actually move in two to three years. And that was the political constraint that we were operating on, not long-term uh, deficit, uh, re deficit reduction. There, were, uh, there was a judgment made, which I think was an ex-ante well, reason. Said not you mean not, the constraint was you had to worry about deficit reduction in the long run. We couldn't spend, than, we, could, we, could have put, uh, we could have put $500 billion in infrastructure in, but the spending would have been coming in, the later in, years. 2013, in 2013, and nobody had an appetite for increased right. spending in 2013, both because it didn't solve the problem in, 20, in 2009 and because it made a deficit problem in 2013. But from the benefit of hindsight, that would have been With a good the benefit thing to of do. hindsight, a longer right. term right. Okay. Uh, infrastructure program would have been desirable if it didn't come at the expense of short doing short of uh, of doing short term <laughs> stimulus, I don't agree with Austin that uh, in, in the extent of his concern about the tax cuts. Part of if first of all, I think more of it was spent than he does. Second, insofar as people took their tax cuts and used them to pay down debt. That accelerated the deleveraging process, which then accelerated uh, the recovery. So I think that targeted tax cuts towards people with high marginal propensities to spend was actually a relatively well-advised strategy. I would say one other. I would say uh, one other thing, and uh, there'd be plenty of my colleagues in the administration, I think, who probably would not share this judgment. I think that, in retrospect, the set of judgments that were made to try to do complicated structural things at the same time we were doing stimulus. I mean, like clean health energy, IT. broad clean energy, broadband, health infor, health uh, information uh, technolo uh, technology, the more complicated structural things, trying to do them all at once. I don't think the results of those efforts have been okay. uh, enormously successful, either in providing stimulus right. or with respect to their stated objectives, which came from conflating them into a framework that was doing them very rapidly. Right. And one last thing, if I could. Yeah. Definitely was a, last thing. This will be the last, I promise. There was a political judgment made, um, which I thought was very reasonable at the time that it was made but that ex post turned out to be wrong. And that political judgment was that if you front loaded large amounts of stimulus and you wanted to get as much stimulus as you could, if there was a need for more stimulus later, 
well, then Congress would always be happy to provide more funds for stimulus. So part of the reason for the judgment to front load was an ex ante reasonable judgment that was ex post wrong, that if you made a mistake and you wanted more spending, you could get it. But if you made a mistake and you got too much spending, you would never be able to undo right, it. Right. Phil, um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to change the subject a little bit. So the advantage of a panel like this is you, you, you can do the do-over, and you can say, given everything I know now, I might have done something differently. And it seems to me one place what's worth thinking about is housing. Mm -hmm. Given where we are now in the housing market five years later, the, how slow the recovery was, how many people are still underwater, was, with the benefit of hindsight, which you didn't have at the time, is there something we could have done differently or more in housing? Sure. I mean, to me, that's, that's exactly the right question. That I, I can imagine two moments. I'll pick one under you know, President Bush and one under, under President Obama. Um, I, you know, again, politically, I don't think it was feasible, but imagine in the spring of 08 doing some massive housing bailout. Now, I, you know, on the Hill, and obviously there are people here who, who can speak to this uh, for themselves, um, the idea of a massive housing bailout was totally unfair, and all the sort of Tea Party sentiments that came out in 09 and afterwards <laughs> would have been there just as well in 2008. Um, but one could have ma imagined doing that, and obviously that would have addressed the underlying source of the problem. Totally unfair but you could have imagined doing it. Now in 2009, in January 2009, they actually could have done it, right? They had the tarp. They basically in the end didn't use much of the tarp, right, the whole, the whole thing. I, I, there's a sense in which I think the, the new administration was prudent at a time when in retrospect, they probably wished they had been imprudent and uh, unfair. They probably could have gotten away with it, but I understand why they didn't at the time. What do you think, Eddie? Do you think? Well, I, I was just thinking, you know, going back, if we thought about one sector where there was evidence of overheating, it would be housing. For, most of the real economy, by the way, does not show any evidence of overheating. If you look up to <laughs> really up to the, the spring of 2008, the one exception, of course, is, is housing, where you had 2.2 million housing starts. Uh, the average was 1.5, so right. it looked like something was going on there. The question would have been, you know, back in the early 2000s and uh, throughout that period, were we too lenient on our regulatory policies with respect to housing, with respect to mortgages. And in retrospect, I think we were. I, you know, I don't think there's any denying that. Um, you, you got a lot of growth out of it, and that was the positive aspect of it, but it did have its... But once the crisis hits, and we have all these people underwater, and we have Once a the crisis hits, there was really very little that could be done. We thought about it. The Obama administration thought about it and tried it. It didn't work. They quietly retracted their policies on that, and it was because I think they were essentially so, uh, un not up to the task. So, and I don't blame them for it either. I think it was, it was simply at that point it was too late. L let me go back to what we talked about earlier. And, and I, I want to just pick up on, on a point. Because I think the important point here in terms of going forward, housing, you name it, in terms of anything that we're doing, is we have to think about what it is that we want to do in terms of moving the economy. Even if you think it's on the demand side, even if you think that it was something that needed to be done immediately, the key issue is whether the kinds of policies that we saw coming out of late 2008 and, or, and 2009 were those that would grow the economy over the long run. And the key one to me is taxation of capital. So if you're threatening to raise taxes on capital, if you're threatening to somehow slow down the growth of investment in the economy, that is not a pro-demand uh, strategy. It's not a strategy that's going to be consistent with high productivity growth, and it's not a strategy that's consistent for the long run. So uh, if I were going back and I, and I was saying, what did we do wrong, that's where it would okay, be. OK, so can, if I, if I that, wait, wait, wait. We, we did the, that's the opposite of what we actually did. We had major tax incentives for investment. And if you remember, one of the critiques at the time, which I disagree with, but the New York Times and others said our problem was we had made the cost of capital too cheap, and so people were replacing right. jobs with machines. Uh, so I, I kind of don't think that was our right. But so let's say, um, but on so, housing, yeah, I think look, your basic situation is you had a twenty-five trillion dollar market which drops to twenty trillion. A bunch of people are now underwater, and. There's a Rubicon River to be crossed. Are you going to write down principle or not? And there are a lot of people who, looking back, say, "Well, why didn't you have massive principle reduction to solve the to solve the debt overhang problem?" There's there was 750 billion dollars of negative equity in the system, 
and nobody can eat $750 billion. And somebody has to eat it. This isn't one that you can count on a wedge or let's count on people staying in their home and continuing to make their payments even though they're underwater. Banks could not accept $750 billion of losses. The government, there was no way they're going to accept $750 billion of write down. So I think anybody who says they should have just done more write down is being way overly simplistic. We thought all about that. Larry was absolutely 100% prescient at the meetings in January of 09, wanting to do everything we could on housing, fully well identified that this was going to be one of the biggest debt overhang <laughs> issues. There's just nothing. We, we didn't have the money to do that. And there was, there was not any way to do that. But in retrospect, in retrospect, you could have used $200 billion from the TAR. No, I, you couldn't. You could have, in retrospect. You could not no, have. So, so, so. Uh, I'm not suggesting you should have, but look, you could have. I think anybody who speaks with complete confidence about this is a fool. This is really hard, and it may be that there was some better design that could have done this better than the, ones, than, the, than the one we found or the one the Bush administration found, and certainly the ultimate outcome has been lousy. But a great deal of what is said with confidence is frankly fatuous. Here's the problem. 700, there's a huge number of people who are underwater. It's easy to say, there's poor Mr. Paulson, Mr. Paulson's foreclosed, it's terrible, for Mr. it's terrible for Mr. Paulson, it's terrible for the bank, it's terrible for everybody. If we just wrote Mr. Paulson's mortgage down, the bank would be better off, Mr. Paulson would be better off, Mr. Paulson's community would be better off, why can't those idiots just get it done? It's really easy to say that, and like somebody came to my office every three days to say that. Really, I did, under <laughs> uh, really, I, I did understand that completely. Here's the problem. The problem is that for every Mr. Paulson, there were about seven Mr. Wessels, and the Mr. Wessels were also underwater. So Paulson's a deadbeat, and I'm paying my mortgage. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> and Mr. Wessel was also underwater. He was underwater about as much as Mr. Paulson was. But he and the bank were doing fine. He was paying his mortgage, and he was doing all of that. If you announced a program where everybody who stopped paying their mortgage could get a lot of relief, then Mr. Wessel would stop paying too. And you would spend a lot of money. And you might, and you'd be doing a hugely unjust thing. I mean, why should all the people who bought houses badly get money relative to all the people who decided to rent or all the people who didn't overpay uh, for houses? And so the problem was, how did you target the Mr. Paulsons without inducing a vast wave of defaults on the part of the Mr. Wessels? And there was caution about setting off an epidemic of uh, mail your key in defaults. I think prudent policymakers should have been cautious uh, about that. In the end, what happened was we didn't have any massive wave of voluntary defaults, and we didn't reach as many, nearly as many people with our housing assistance as we would have liked. Was there an outcome available that was better? Uh, perhaps. Uh, there was, perhaps there wasn't, but you really want to have a government that is prudent about the possibility of setting off a vast wave of defaults. And Philip, with great respect, if you're confident that $200 billion uh, could, have been, uh, could have been moved without setting off a set of, pro setting off a large set of problems and that there were easy, feasible mechanisms, you have a confidence that goes well beyond anybody whose lifetime has been spent near the world of mortgages. Really? So, <laughs> All right. I, I, so I, I, brief rejoinder. Now I want to change the topic. Uh, you know, obviously, I didn't, I didn't say that, so that's a, it's a strange way of phrasing it. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, what's remarkable to me, uh, and again, this is, this is across administrations, is seeing the problems and addressing them, but too late, right? There's a sense in which the TALF, for example, right, which was started in November of 08 and, and you know, so was put into action in May or something of 09, right, that addressed the problem of August of 07, 
right? So it was the right policy, it just it took time. And so on housing, I think of HARP, the HARP program, which eventually you know, reached a couple million people, I think it's just they don't get enough credit for it. Um, but it really wasn't effective until HARP 2, right, which was you know, just within the last year, the last year and a half. So, I mean, it's the same, it's the same problem, seeing the, seeing the problem, diagnosing it, and just taking time to get a policy solution. And I, you know, I think it's, it's the problem okay. with both sides. All right, so here it's 2013. The economy's been growing for four years. We have 7.2% unemployment, nearly three million people out of work for a full year or more, and still looking, not counting those who aren't looking. We're far from potential. Is there nothing we could have done either in 08, 09, or since then that would have put us in a better place now? I mean, Ed, you seem to suggest that if we cut capital gains taxes, we could be better. Is that what you were saying? What we, there were a lot of things that we could have done then. So pick one. Looking pick for, something. Right. What, one thing we could do is, uh, again, not just ca capital gains tax. To me, the single most important thing we can do is reduce taxes on investment, essentially not tax capital. This is not controversial. This is kind of standard mainstream economics, public finance economics. Most people believe we shouldn't be taxing capital. We way overtax it. We have a lot of distortions in the system having to do with debt versus equity. Those are things that okay. can be remedied, should be re remedied. Hang on, Larry. All right. That, that's, that's, number, that's my number one. Okay. Number two, I would say, is uh, if we're thinking about where we need to look for the future, I would be focusing more on trade. I, I credit uh, the Obama administration with a couple of things. First of all, I would say getting through the free trade agreements that we had negotiated right. at the end of our term was actually a major accomplishment and one that, for which they deserve credit. Um, I wish they would have been more aggressive in laying out the future. We're, we seem okay. to be moving in that direction. Now. Larry, you seem to be moved to speak. <laughs> hey, let's be serious here. Um, Trade. I thought I was being serious. Yeah. On a, on a <laughs> high-end, on a high-end, I mean, I'm all for I'm all for the free trade agreements. They're right. wonderful things. On a high-end estimate of the whole lot of it, it's a tenth of a percent of GDP a year. Um, of the ones that of the Korea, Colombia, oh, those, yeah. the, yeah. Uh, yeah. of those, and a high-end estimate of the rest of it is way under half a percent of GDP once. So it's just, it's, I'm all for it, it's good in a whole set of ways, but it's just not big. On investment, can we just understand what the rules were and what the environment was? On equipment, which is about 70 to 75% of corporate investment, you buy yourself a new car. The first year you buy the car, you get to deduct the whole thing from your taxes. And by the way, the interest rate at which you could borrow was lower than it had been in American history since the Second World War. So the idea that when you had record high deductibility and record low borrowing costs, that somehow the high cost of capital was, was what was discouraging investment, I have to say, I think is ludicrous. And by the way, when you ask businesses why they weren't investing, they said they weren't investing because they didn't have any orders and they had substantial excess capacity. And so why should you invest when you have substantial excess capacity? So you can, we can debate um, the, what the right kind of corporate tax reform is going forward. And I think corporate tax reform is, um, is, uh, is important and makes a contribution. But in terms of the broad sweep, I mean, if you want to take an argument from your side, um, I think that many people on your side overdo this argument. But the argument that um, this is not the moment for a big regulatory push on bad business practices and that you need to be careful about the tendency that always exists in a new democratic administration for new regulations to be coming from 11 different sources and that that may delay some investment and discourage some investment at a moment when you're demand constrained. You know, I think that argument is, tends to be very much overdone, but I understand that argument as a legitimate concern and it's something that needs to be a focus of economic policy in the sense that confidence is probably the cheapest form of stimulus. But the idea that it's costs of capital and taxation, I know that's a, sort of a, a standby um, for, one side, for one side of the aisle, but 
it had its single it had, it had single least plausible moment in the last sixty years in uh, two thousand and nine, both okay. because of the expensing and the low interest I, I rates. I want to respond to that, Dave. I thought uh, you might. Are, uh, yeah. All right. So, I, I, Larry, I think you're living back in 2009. I mean, I know that was the, the period in which you were concerned about this. I'm not. I'm thinking in terms of where we are today and what the policy should be for the future and what we need to do to, do to grow the economy into the future. You may argue that in 2009, uh, it was lack of demand. It was not the fact that capital was too costly. Guaranteed, if you look at the evidence on this, look at the OECD evidence, you pick any evidence you want. Capital taxation is without question the most distortionary taxation that you can have because capital is mobile. And if we want to grow the economy, the way that we have to think about growing the economy is moving to a more efficient tax system. Now, more efficient, we, you and I might differ a, a bit on that, although I think fundamentally we probably wouldn't differ so much. Uh, but if I'm thinking about what's the right policy for the long run, I agree with you, cost-benefit analysis of regulation is important. But to me, the number one concern okay. is what do we do to motivate right, capital over the long run? Let me pick up something run. Larry said. So one thing that happens after a financial crisis, it must be inevitable, there must be some professor whose name is associated with this, is that we go from probably having not enough capital in the banking system, not enough constraints, on not enough tough enough supervision, not forcing them to have enough liquidity, and then we go, we overreact. So Phil, do you think, given where we are now, that the, the whole regulatory architecture, the supervisory architecture, Basel III, QX2, whatever they are, that we've gone too far and that that's a constraint on the economy now? Um, I mean, sure, we've gone too far in some ways. I and mean, you can look at the sort of extreme parts of uh, Dodd-Frank, the, the Lincoln Amendment, right? I think there's consensus that that doesn't make any sense. Um, uh, but on the whole, right, the, the additional capital, um, the liquidity requirements, even the CFPB has done a pretty good job overall. So I wouldn't say it's gone too far. Sure, it's had some negative effects, but I, I think it's not surprising that we, we had Dodd-Frank uh, in the aftermath of the crisis. In, in some sense, you know, to me, the, the, the mistake or the tragedy, if you will, is that the regulators had lots of powers before, right? It wasn't like there was something that Dodd-Frank gave them that they didn't have to prevent the crisis, or he gave them Title II, the resolution authority, to deal with it after the fact that would have been especially useful back in 08. But they had the authority back then. They just didn't, they didn't use it. Well, so what do you think? Have we made it too hard to get credit? In, in 2013? Is that why we're going so the, the, There was always, we, we, we got on this weird circle in which small business people would come to the White House and say, we can't get credit, that's why we can't grow. Mm -hmm. Then the banks would say, no, we, we haven't tightened up. They would say, it's the banks. The banks have tightened the, the standards. The banks said, we didn't tighten the standards. Some of them are less credit worthy, but they don't want any credit. They're, 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 nobody's right. applying. Right. And we kind of went back and forth on that. And then they both agreed, OK, well, let's just blame it on the regulators. But then you talk to the regulators and say, we haven't applied any different standard to the banks. Right. Uh, so I, I think it's very hard to say. I think. It feels to me like at least 75% of the tightness of credit has nothing to do with government regulation. It has to do with everybody was scarred. We just came through a, mm -hmm. such a horrible period that they pulled in the lines of credit. They've, they're emphatically not willing to lend at the kind of rates that they were before. Some comes from regulatory, but you know we do have to move on those issues. And I worry that if you said, we know we need to get to a capital ratio of whatever, seven and a half percent. And we know we're at three, but we don't want to mess anything up in the short run, so let's not actually discuss that until sometime way in the future. I think the you chances are we would never right, do it. Right. Briefly? Two words. Covenant light. It's back. Right. That suggests that we're not starving the world uh, for <laughs> right. credit on uh, a general basis right now. I think there are issues in the, mortgage, uh, in the mortgage space where there is too little capital available today. And I think that that is something, I think there is a danger that in the name of preventing the abuses of the 2003 to 2006 period, we will take steps that will lead to too much mortgage credit, too, li too, mu too little mortgage capital availability, yeah. which will in turn depress housing prices. But for business credit, it's mostly the demand side. Eddie, the, uh, this has been an unprecedented period for monetary policy as well. Um, bottom line, did all this quantitative easing, $3 trillion worth of money being printed to buy bonds, 
was it, did it do something good? Was it worth it? Uh, my view is that the, the first wave was very effective and was extremely important. I think the, the Fed behaved not only responsibly, but um, also uh, admirably. Uh, by the way, we, we have the governor of the Bank of England here as well, and uh, credit, credit to that bank as well uh, for what they did. I think they were very effective and uh, very helpful. Uh, my sense is we've, we've reached rapidly diminishing returns on this. Um, you know, I, I don't believe that the economy is healed sufficiently, that we can declare victory and say it's the end, uh, it's time to stop uh, buying assets. The reason for stop buying stopping to buy assets is not that the economy is in better shape, but rather because the policy is no longer particularly effective. And uh, at this point, So I they think should that, stop or they shouldn't stop? No, that's what I said. I, I, would, I would be inclined to, to taper at this point, but not because the economy is strong. I'd be inclined to taper because the, the second necessary condition, which is that the policy works, is absent. I, right. I don't believe that it's working. Larry, do you want to share a view on that or not? Don't filibuster. If you don't want to do it, don't do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Austin? Look, I think it, if 10 years ago you said any economy, not just the U.S., the unemployment rate's going to have been 7.5% or above for something like four or five straight years. Growth's going to have been 2% for four or five straight years, and core inflation is still well below the 2% target. Every economist in the world would say, obviously, you should loosen monetary policy in that environment. If you plug into the formula, it depends which one you use, that says, what should the interest rate be? It spits back the interest rate should be negative 2.5%. So all the Fed has been trying to do for years is what it should be doing. How do we loosen monetary policy when the interest rate is already okay. bumping around zero? All right, let me so ask one final question that. of each of you quickly, and then we'll turn to the audience. So one of my concerns is that uh, it wasn't a V, it wasn't even a U, that we have done damage to the potential growth rate of the U.S. economy, the rate at which living standards will increase. Uh, do you think, Phil, that we have dented the potential growth rate, yes, yes or no? No, I, I, I don't think so. I mean, I look at uh, the innovative parts of our economy, and they're just as innovative, if not more so, than they were in the past. Okay. Larry, what do you think? I don't think we've permanently reduced the growth rate. I think we've permanently reduced the level. And so I think that GDP out for the next, as far as one can see, uh, will be on the order of 3 4% lower than it otherwise would have been. And the present value of that is a spectacularly high cost of this episode, which is why it would be worth doing a great deal, doing almost anything uh, to, growth, growth. to mitigate this uh, slack. Eddie? Uh, I, I think I agree. I, I guess the one thing I would say is if you look at the data, it does look like we've permanently reduced the growth rate. We're at a 2% growth rather than closer to 3%, which is the historic average. But if you ask, are the fundamentals still there for long-term growth, I think they are. We haven't significantly depreciated the stock of human capital. We haven't significantly depreciated the stock of physical capital. And our ability to create technology is still there. Those are the ingredients for rapid growth. Austin, optimist or pessimist? There was a joke head, headline in that joke paper, The Onion. Furious nation demands new bubble to invest in to restore prosperity. <laughs> I fear that sometimes we can get into, into that. The 2000s expansion was fueled by a bubble. We cannot go back to that. So we're going to have slow growth for some period because that was overstating what the actual growth was. But I, I don't think long run we're getting off the, the old trend. I think it's all the fundamentals are there. God, I think you all agree and you're all on the glass half full thing. I know what's what they serve for breakfast. All right, we're <laughs> going to turn to the audience. Uh, here's the rules. Raise your hand, wait for a mic, say who you are, and remember that a question ends with a question mark. We already got four guys here who want to talk for another <laughs> hour, and we have a busy program, so ask a question. Uh, there's one here in the front, a woman in the front. And why doesn't someone else raise their hand so the next mic, if there is another one, can go to someone else on this side here? You got one in the back there. Someone over here? I see in the back, back by the speaker. Uh, thank you. I'm Yang Chung from University of Chicago. Uh, my question for the panelists is, well, you guys are both policymakers, but also academics. So how much of the policies that were enacted during the time when you were in the administrations were in 
in accordance with your academic bearings, and how much of it is as of pressure of the political environment. In other words, during the course of the panel, the term like in retrospect or with wisdom of hindsight was used a lot. How much of that hindsight was actually foreseeable at the time with your academic standing, but were not applicable because of the political environment and other pressures? Sorry, I got so okay. so I, I, I can say a few words on that one, because uh, you know, since, since, since I was the, the person who would receive the incoming fire from academics, and I'll just tell two stories without <laughs> giving the names. But these are two very eminent uh, economists, uh, one, here, one here at Booth and one at Harvard. Um, saying, look, the only thing you guys needed to do to save Lehman was just change the bankruptcy code, right? Just turn the debt into equity and you're done. And it's like, well, no, it was, okay. So, you know, this is the <laughs> obtuseness of the, the way that the, the government works. Uh, and then number two is when we were moving um, from the asset purchases to the, uh, the capital injections, and I did around- It was around a very slow period where the, the yeah, short period of asset not, purchases, I recall. Yeah, exactly. Well, we worked hard on it. But uh, I, I basically made a round of phone calls to, uh, to academics saying, look, we're about to do this. It wasn't put that, it was sort of, we're thinking of doing this, what do you think? Well, of course, we're going to do it, and you know, just to basically get people on board. Um, and so one very eminent uh, academic said to me, you know, you know, look, this is just the financial sector was too big, and this is just uh, it's shrinking to its, its right size. And my response was, well, it's a pretty tough way of doing it. I mean, don't you think we should cushion it? Or respond, he's like, nah, it's just. So Larry, does, did, did all the academic work have prepare you as a policymaker or the, your colleagues up here for this? No, academic macro academic macroeconomics has been in a lacuna of dynamic stochastic general equilibrium for 25 years. <laughs> that was unconnected to any aspect of the problem. There were important academics who had written very important things that were influential. They were people like Keynes. They were people like Minsky. Uh, they were uh, people like uh, Kindleberger. They mostly had written. They mostly had written. Uh, a dead. long time uh, had, had had written a long time before. So surely the macroeconomic training we had all received very much influenced uh, what we did. But I would say most of what passes for contemporary macroeconomics did not make a positive uh, did not make a positive contribution. Yeah, I I, I agree and disagree with Larry. I, I certainly agree. You know, we didn't spend a lot of time thinking about real business cycle theory when trying to construct economic policy on the fly in, in 2007, 2008. The one thing I will say, though, is that um, virtually everything I think I did, and, and I, I would I would venture to say the same is true of my colleagues up here, uh, are based on the human capital that you acquire being an academic. And we do think differently about problems in government than the rest of our colleagues do. So if you look at Council of Economic Advisors and the Bush administration, the Clinton administration, and the Obama administration, there's a lot more similarity there between those groups than there is between me and the political people, uh, say, in the Bush administration. So well, the political there people is, will get the, their voice later about how. <laughs> Thank God we weren't all economists. Well, possibly. But when you see economists starting to think about politics, beware. I think what, what we're best True. at doing is sticking to our knitting, bringing some logical arguments to the table, and, and those usually win out in the long run. And, and okay. and if I could well. say one sentence as you call one on sentence. them. No, you can call on them as he stands up. Okay. I'll just say it was surprisingly infrequent that in our discussions, and Larry was running the process, the... Most policy was about what's the right policy. The, the argument by political people that, oh, no, you, you may want to do that, but we can't do that. That very, very seldom happened. Right. Gentleman over here, I think. Uh, Jim McDaniel. I'm a partner at uh, Sidley Austin. Uh, my question goes to root cause of the problem. Uh, there seems to be uh, almost a consensus can, can, that can a fundamental problem, if not the fundamental cause of the crisis, was uh, the highly leveraged home mortgage market and the housing bubble. We know that government didn't recognize that in time at least, but what was wrong with the private sector? This was funded, after all, 
primarily right. by private investment. How is it? We know what the buyer's motivation was, mm -hmm. or we know what the seller's motivation was, but what was the buyer's motivation and why didn't they recognize that they were purchasing what quickly okay. were, became toxic right. assets? So what happened to market discipline? All financial error has the same root cause. People doing today what they wish they had done yesterday. That's what drives bubbles. You buy the stocks that have already gone up. You sit there in the mortgage market. For 40 years, whoever lent the most made the most. Whoever took more chances made more money. And so you go into more and more venturesome securities, because what else can you learn from except the past? And so people extrapolate. And so I would argue that virtually all financial error is, has as its root naive extrapolation from the past, and that that, and that getting past that, that's why, if you think about it, all the great investors are in some way or other uh, contrarians who reject uh, the lessons of uh, recent experience. So let's take uh, two or three, here's one here. Let me, maybe I collect three and we can get, see there's one here and there's two over there. Can someone bring the mic down here? And then why don't you go to the other side? The gentleman here on the aisle. Uh, thank you for all the panelists for coming here. I'm a, a second year MBA student at the Boot School of Business. Uh, my question is a lot has been said about the incentives on Wall Street being a lot to blame for the crisis. But to me it seems that the incentives in the, for the politicians in Congress and at the Senate are equally to blame for maybe not taking care of the crisis after it unfolded. And even now we see with the budget mess most of them are just inclined to get reelected and so on and so forth. So I want to get your views on how do you think the incentives are and on the governance side for solving problems in the U.S. at the moment? Okay, so let's take a couple more and then we'll let people have a shot. The gentleman over there with his hand up and then the young man in front of him. Uh, when Rahm Emanuel spoke the words that no good crisis should go wasted, was he referring to the opportunity for political gain for one or the other party? or the opportunity for gain for our society? Well, get Ram, will have to get, Ram can answer that later when he's here. Uh, and the gentleman in front of you. Hi, uh, my name is John McDonough. I'm a fourth year economics major at the University of Chicago. Um, we talked briefly about monetary policy. And my question is, um, increasing lending uh, conditions is, is a top priority. And do you think that the, um, the policy of paying interest on excess reserves has inhibited that? Um, and should it be discontinued? Okay, so, so three very different questions. Some want to take the, someone want to do what Eddie says economists shouldn't do and talk about politicians. Are there bad incentives for the political system? Well, I'm an incentive guy, so uh, I'll, okay. I'll start with that. Uh, I think there are some bad incentives. Um, the, the best incentives actually are held at the White House. And the, the reason is that the president is an executive uh, and everybody works for the president. And, and certainly our role in the administration was to make sure that the president did the right thing. Congress has different incentives. Congress uh, consists of individuals whose incentives are designed to get attention for the individual. So I don't think we can rely, with the, all due respect to the people from Congress who are here, I don't think we can rely on Congress to do this. The incentives are appropriate, but they're appropriate at the executive branch. It requires leadership, uh, and I think that's, that's what Doesn't we really need to Doesn't sound like an argument see. for democracy. Well, I think it is. No, I think that the Congress's role is, is one of making sure that the president does the right thing, but the leadership has to come from the White House. I think that's how the incentives are designed. They've always been designed that way. They're pretty effective. They've worked for a long time, uh, and uh, I don't see a problem, but I don't think you can expect that Congress is going to come up with the appropriate kinds of mechanisms that will further economic growth. That has to be an executive branch function. There's one overarching incentive problem in our politics. And that is that you need a lot of money to get and hold office. And therefore, politicians are disproportionately responsive to those who finance them. And that centrality of money uh, in our politics is by far uh, the biggest incentive, uh, biggest incentive problem we have. Austin, you want to speak for Rom? Uh, <laughs> what did he mean when he said the crisis is a terrible thing to waste? I don't. I only saw that quoted, so I shouldn't s s say what the. Larry might know what the actual context was. Oh. Is it? 
He was very clear. I mean, it was very clear. Right. He meant that it was an opportunity to do things when political obstacles became uh, much more fluid. I mean, you can debate what things you should do and how many things you should do and how you should use that mandate. But his context was unambiguously clear that it was an opportunity to do things. And a classic example was his conviction, which I think was right, that you could do substantially more to reform financial regulation than you ever could have done absent this kind of uh, provocation. I mean, I, I would just say, looking at the, some of those questions, at the beginning of 2009, there's a sense of a missed opportunity, right? I mean, there's opportunities taken and the fiscal stimulus uh, you know, w was needed. I, I just wonder if a different kind of stimulus Right, with some of the changes that Larry hinted at, dropping some of the, the high-speed rail and energy and all, all that, might have gotten bipartisan support. Right? I mean, I, I know today people say, no, Republicans will oppose anything President Obama suggests. But you know, back in the beginning of 2009, many people were really hoping, right? This is, this is the guy who's going to bring us together. And it didn't happen. And I'm not blaming one side or the other. There's, of course, going to be fault on both sides. But to me, that's the, the question is, could a different set of choices have brought the country together in a way that, uh, that didn't happen. You know, I, I've been critical of some of the more classically democratic parts of the recovery program, but I was there. You know, the Senate minority leader said that the basic purpose of his minority leadership was to make sure that the president was not reelected. Uh, you know, I, I think it's not easy to make the case that the people in the administration were prepared to walk a long mile uh, to get substantial uh, to get substantial support. So I think it would have been much more much more difficult, and the price of doing it would have been much more stuff not in the infrastructure direction, but in the tax cut uh, direction that I think would have been fairly problematic. Can I, can I, yeah. can I just pick up on the last question yeah, on the uh, uh, Fed policy and whether paying interest on reserves is a, hey, is a before problem? Before you do that, can I just oh, yeah, can please, I say for fiscal? Sure. I, I mean, the, the, I was there. Look, I mean, there are many of us from Treasury who are helping people on the Hill. So there's a sense in which you know, there's many people who say I was there. Um, the feeling in Republicans on the Hill was that the administration didn't walk the mile, that there's eight years of pent up spending, and it, it came out. And, you know, to me, it's. Uh, I would you know, only say that, that's before, so the administration comes in January 20, mm -hmm. 2009, they're already holding up many of our economic nominations. As we come in, we're supposed to. We've had right. the so hearings. We're supposed before. to. Well, yeah. right. Yes, okay. but I'm. I'm saying it was. It right. was quite clear okay. the partisanship uh, yeah. was. Wait, wait, wait. That's, that's, was just, that's just counterfactual. This is completely that is not, counterfactual. That is right. just Christy completely Romer not counterfactual. I can give you a list of. Uh, right, but, but the, the Treasury Secretary held is held up for his own reasons. Had no, I'm not talking about the Treasury. You you were held up for reasons having to do with with Senator Reid's. You know what he did in the past, but, right, with Donald Marin and uh, yeah. and others. I, I, I just anyway, I, I just think it's completely uh, uh, counterfactual. Okay, Eddie. So. The question was from the interest. The Fed used to have reserves and they didn't pay interest right. on them. Yeah. One of the changes is that now they can pay interest, and they right. look at this as a new tool for how to influence interest rates. That's right. So uh, a number of people, just to put this in context, a number of people have been arguing that one of the problems in terms of uh, funding investment in the private sector is that the Fed is sucking the money out of the system by paying interest on reserves. I, I think there's very little evidence that that's the case. Uh, the, the design of that policy was primarily to make sure that there was control over the Fed funds rate to keep the bands of, fend, of the Fed funds rate much narrower than they had been. Remember that that was at a time when Fed funds was volatile. It was all over the place. It seemed to have worked quite effectively. And I think that's the, the evidence for that policy uh, is, is pretty positive. Uh, and I think the evidence against it in terms of its long-term effect uh, is minimal. Now, that doesn't mean that it couldn't be used to harm the private sector by sucking the money out of the economy because the Fed has discretion on the rate at which it, uh, it, it pays for those funds, uh, obviously by paying a rate that would be too high, you could do a lot of damage. But I don't think that there's any evidence that it has up to okay. this point. I'm afraid we have to end it there. Uh, I want to thank the panel. And please join me in thanking them and for your good questions. And uh, I just want to note that we had, we had an hour-long discussion.
And nobody blamed the media for anything. That's the first time that's happened to me on any panel ever.